When we talk about computers these days, we're usually referring to what's called a PC, a personal computer. A computer that comes in basically one of two configurations, a desktop or a laptop system. A desktop is a non-portable system where the actual screen, the display, the monitor, is a separate unit from the computer itself, which is usually this small tower. In a laptop system, the monitor and the computer itself are put together in one portable unit, and whereas with a desktop, the keyboard and the pointing device, the mouse, are attached via cords to the computer, in a laptop, the keyboard and the pointing device, a trackpad, are built onto the computer itself. So it's all one physical portable unit. The term hardware simply refers to any physical component of a computer system. If you can hold it in your hand, it's hardware. Software, in contrast, is not physical. Software is simply the instructions which are executed by the computer. What we call a program is just a piece of software. It's some set of instructions for some coherent purpose. Programs can be written to do all sorts of things, but here's the list of what are probably the nine most commonly used types of programs today. First off, a word processor is simply a program for creating and editing textual documents. A spreadsheet is a program mostly used in business. It presents the user with a grid of rows and columns into which the user can plug data, and then the user can uh, have the spreadsheet perform calculations upon these rows and columns, and also do things like, say, draw charts from this data. When people talk about using the internet, what they're usually really talking about is using a web browser. A web browser displays web pages, which are textual and graphical documents which are retrieved from other computers out there on the internet. By far, web browsing has become the most popular thing to do with a computer. Web browsing probably now takes up over 90% of the time people spend using computers. An email client is a program you use to send and receive email. An email, very simply, is a textual message you send to another user on the internet. An instant messenger is also a program you can use to send textual messages to other people on the internet, but it works a bit differently. Email is like sending a letter. You send it off, and then it sits in the recipient's mailbox until they check their mailbox. With instant messaging, it's expected that the recipient is also running an instant messenger at the time you send the message, and the message then instantly appears in their instant messenger program. The message doesn't sit and wait in a mailbox until they check it later. With most instant messengers, you can't send a message to someone who isn't currently running their instant messenger program. So instant messaging, or IMing as it's called, is more appropriate for uh, immediate conversations. It's more like a chat room except the messages are still private, like with email. They only get sent to one recipient. A media player, unsurprisingly, is a program for playing media. And when we say media, we mean mainly video and audio. So say, if you put a DVD in your computer and wish to play it, you use a media player to do so. An image editor, of course, is a program for creating and manipulating digital images. By far, the most popular program for this purpose is a program called Photoshop. In fact, Photoshop has been so popular for so long that the word Photoshop has become synonymous with manipulating digital images. So you'll commonly hear people talk about Photoshopping an image to mean digitally manipulating that image. Most video these days is now digital, and so it's edited on computers using programs called video editors. Even stuff that's still shot on film these days is edited with video editing software because it's just that much easier to do it on a computer rather than having to deal with all this physical film. And finally, the last type of program to mention, games. And games, of course, run the gamut from the very early video games like Pac-Man and Pong to simple card games like Solitaire and then today's modern games with complicated 3D graphics. Actually, there's one more important type of program to talk about, and that's what's called an operating system. An operating system is a very different kind of program because it's not one you use to accomplish any particular task, it's a program you use to run other programs. It's the operating system in a modern computer which allows it to run multiple programs at once. When you power on your computer, 
the first thing it does is it loads the operating system which you have installed on that system. Once the operating system has loaded, you can then use its interface to launch other programs. For the last two decades, the most popular operating system to run on PCs has been Microsoft Windows, the latest version of which is called Windows 7, and that was released in 2009. The version before that was called Windows Vista, and the version before that was called Windows XP. Here in 2010, you should be at least using Windows Vista, if not Windows 7. A lot of people are still running Windows XP, even though they really shouldn't, for reasons I'll explain later having to do with security. You, you generally shouldn't run very old software. The two main alternatives to Windows are an operating system called Linux and Apple's operating system called Mac OS X. Linux is interesting because it's an example of what's called free or open source software, meaning that anyone is legally allowed to use, copy, and modify the software. So as a user, that means you don't have to pay for it. Only about 2% or so of users worldwide use Linux on their PC, but Linux otherwise is a very successful piece of software because it's used in all sorts of other devices, like probably your car or your cell phone or your toaster or your cable box or your TiVo. Tons and tons of stuff out there runs Linux, even though it's not very popular on PCs. Mac OS X, in contrast, has become increasingly popular in the last 10 years, and now it accounts for maybe 10% of PCs, at least in the United States. OS X is certainly not free, and in fact, Apple only wants you to run OS X on computers which you buy from them, even though the hardware which Apple sells internally isn't really any different than what you can buy, say, from Dell. The cases are different, and they make their own keyboards and mice, but otherwise it's just the same stuff. However, to stop people from running OS X on hardware which they themselves do not sell, Apple put a check into OS X such that when it loads, it looks for the specific chip, and if your hardware doesn't have this chip, which only Apple sells, OS X will not load. So just be clear what you're paying for when you buy an Apple computer. Apple charges a 30 to 50% premium for the same hardware you can buy from other computer makers, but people pay it because they like Apple's nice shiny case design, but most importantly because they want to run OS X, and the only way they can do it is by buying their computer from Apple. Now whether you use Windows or Linux or Mac OS X, the user interface is generally about the same in each of them. Many details differ, but the big ideas are really just the same. So while the material I'm about to cover is a bit biased towards Windows, it's for the most part applicable to all three different operating systems. So first off, the central concept in the user interface of all of these operating systems is that of a window which is in fact why Microsoft calls their operating system Windows. The point of a window is that in a modern operating system, we want the ability to run multiple programs at once. And what that means is when you have multiple programs running, each program can't monopolize the entire screen. They need to share screen space. And so the idea is that each program is presented on the screen as its own box, a window. And that window you can move around, and the windows can overlap each other, and you can resize the windows to your liking. And each window has three basic components. You have at the top, you have the title bar, where it says the name of the program. Uh, you have a border around the window, and then you have the content pane, the space where the actual program interface is displayed. So whatever the program wishes to show the user, it gets displayed in the content pane. To interact with these windows, users need a pointing device, and on desktop PCs, that's going to be a mouse. What the user is currently pointing at on screen is represented by a cursor, which is usually just a little arrow, and they move the cursor around by moving their mouse around on the desk. And the typical mouse these days has three buttons, a left button, a right button, and a middle button, and the middle button on most mice these days doubles as a scroll wheel. So you could push it in to click that button, or you can actually roll the wheel up and down. By far, the most important button is the left mouse button. It's the one you'll be clicking the most. And if you're right-handed, you should be clicking it with your index finger. If you're left-handed, uh, most mice you can configure so that the buttons are swapped. So what we call the left mouse button is actually the right mouse button. 
So that's something you may want to do if you're going to be moving the mouse with your left hand. A lot of left-handed users just get used to using the mouse with their right hand, or they simply just uh, learn to click with their uh, ring finger rather than their index finger. In any case, what clicking the left mouse button actually does is really up to what is under the cursor on the screen. When the cursor is over something on the screen which looks like a pressable button, clicking the left mouse button should press that button. For many other things, when you click the left mouse button, what it does is it selects that thing underneath the cursor. And in other cases, clicking the left mouse button simply will change the focus, what's called keyboard focus, to the thing which you click on. And by giving a thing keyboard focus, it means that when you type keys on the keyboard, those keystrokes apply to the thing that's been given focus. For example, when you wish to use the keyboard to interact with a window, you need to make sure that window first has keyboard focus, otherwise your keystrokes aren't going to apply to that window. Some things on screen can be interacted with by clicking and dragging them. To click and drag simply means to click the left mouse button, but hold it down, then move the mouse, and then release the left mouse button. So for example, the thing we use click and drag the most for is to move our windows around and then also to resize them, to make them bigger or smaller. So here I have this single window. I click on its title bar and hold the mouse button down as I move the mouse around. I let go and the window is repositioned. If I then click and drag on the border of the window, I can resize the window. And notice that it matters which edge of the window I click. If I click on the top edge, I can only move the top up and down. If I click on one of the corners, I can move that corner in and out, and so forth. Now, if you look at the screen in Microsoft Windows, you'll notice usually at the bottom of the screen, there's this thing we call the taskbar. And on the right side of the taskbar, you should see a display of the current time. And on the left side of the taskbar, you should see a button which you can click to open what's called the Start menu. In earlier versions of Windows, this button was actually labeled Start, but in more recent versions, in Windows Vista and Windows 7, it's just a Windows icon. As we'll get into later, the Start menu is what you use to start programs. For now, we're just going to look at the taskbar itself. The idea of the taskbar is that for every window you have open, there's a button representing that window on the taskbar. So here, because we have a Microsoft Word window and a Photoshop window, there are buttons on the taskbar representing each of them. When you click on the window itself, you bring that window forward and you give it keyboard focus. But another way to do this is not by clicking on the window itself, but by clicking on the button that represents that window on the taskbar. This alternative method of bringing a window forward is very important because sometimes you might have a window which is totally obscured by other windows, so there's no way you can click on it. You need to go to the taskbar to click on its button to bring it forward. The area of the screen which is not the taskbar and which is behind the windows is called the desktop surface, or just simply called the desktop. Rather than leaving this as just a boring blank solid color, a lot of people like to put an image on their desktop, what's called a wallpaper. And on the desktop itself, but behind all of the windows, you might have some number of icons. These icons, as we'll discuss in the next unit, are really just files. But for now, we won't say anything more about files, icons, or the desktop. In the top right of every program window, you should see these three buttons in this order. On the left, there's the Minimize button. In the middle, there's the Maximize, Demaximize button. And on the right, there's a Close button. The Close button, not surprisingly, closes the window. It gets rid of the window, and it exits the program. and makes the program stop running. The Maximize window puts the window into a special state where it covers the whole desktop area and it's on top of all the other windows. And to get it out of the state so that it's a resizable and movable window again, you have to then click the same middle button to demaximize the window. And finally, to minimize a window means to hide the window such that the only way to get it back to make it reappear is to click on its button on the taskbar. So, here I click the Minimize button, the window goes away, I go, back, go down to the taskbar to click its button, and it reappears. I hit the Maximize button, and now it's taking up the whole screen area, except for the taskbar. I click the button again, and it restores back to a regular window, which I can move around.
and then if I hit the close button, uh, the window then goes away, and here I click the close button on this other window, and it goes away too. Now, so far when we've talked about windows, we've assumed that each window is its own separate program, but that's not always necessarily the case. In many programs, you have these secondary windows called pop-ups or dialogues. The general idea of a pop-up dialogue is that it's a temporary window. It's a window which the user is meant to interact with and then hit OK or cancel to get rid of. So here, for example, in Microsoft Word, when I click the button for configuring the page setup, uh, the margins and the size of the paper and, and, and so forth, I get this dialog window which has all of those options and I need to specify the configuration I want and then when I'm done and have everything the way I want, I hit OK and then the window will go away. If, however, I change my mind and decide I don't want to make any changes to the page setup, I can hit cancel and the dialog will go away without changing anything. Here's another example. This program is displaying a document and if I click this button here to print the document, I get this pop-up dialog and the window contains all sorts of complicated options about how I want to print the document, and then there's a button for OK and a button for Cancel. If I were to click OK, the document would then print with all of these options. If I were to hit Cancel, it would just cancel the whole printing, and the, the dialog would go away. Notice what happens, though, with this dialog when I try and click on the main window. When I try and do that, when I try and interact with the main window again, it doesn't let me because the dialog is still open. So dialogues very often do this. They block any interaction with the main window. So you have to get rid of the window by either hitting OK or Cancel. And note that this dialog has the big red X close button in the top right. If you click that, it's the same thing as clicking Cancel. Dialogues come in varying degrees of complexity. Like say in the top right here, a fairly complicated one is this dialog for opening a file. And very commonly, you'll see simple dialogues like this, which are simply asking us to confirm if we really want to do something. In this case, do I really want to delete this file, yes or no? And then annoyingly, sometimes you get these dialog windows which don't want to ask you anything, they just want to tell you something, and you have to hit OK to make them go away. And dialog windows of all kinds tend to be annoying to users for basically two reasons. The first is they very often block interaction with the main window, and the second reason they can be annoying is because it's very easy for these little dialog windows to get lost behind other windows. And unlike with program windows, these dialog windows don't usually have a button representing them in the taskbar. So if they get lost behind other windows, the user might not even be aware that the dialog window is there. Finally, we should be clear that there are cases where a single program is made up of multiple windows and those other windows aren't necessarily dialogues because you're not meant to interact with them and then hit OK or Cancel. Like here, for example, in this image editing program, you have the window with the image itself, and then we have this separate window with all these little tools we can use to manipulate the image. The designers of this program could have simply put these things together in one window, but they decided that users would want the flexibility to position these things separately, so they made them separate windows. While every program interface is different, you'll find that there's a set of commonly reoccurring elements that show up in all sorts of programs. Program designers call these common elements widgets. For example, the simplest and probably most common kind of widget is simply a button. A button is simply something the user is meant to click to perform some action, and the textual label on the button or some icon on the button is meant to indicate what that action will be. So here, for example, the button labeled Close self-evidently will close this dialog window, but what this button labeled Manage does is less obvious. You generally have to look at context, like here you can see it has something to do with default search, whatever that means in this particular program. Another very common widget is a text box, which is simply a place you can click to start typing and editing text. This text box here already has the text http colon slash slash www.google.com slash, but you can click and type in this text box to change that. A drop down list often looks like a button, but on the right side you'll see a small triangle pointing downwards, and that indicates that this is a drop down list, so if you click on it, you'll get this pop up list in which you can click to select some other item. A checkbox is simply a small little box which you click to toggle the check on and off. 
In this example, the checkbox is currently toggled on, and the text next to the checkbox indicates what this checkbox does. These little circular buttons aren't checkboxes, they're called radio buttons. The idea with radio buttons is that you have a group of them and only one thing in the group can be selected. So here we're given three choices, open the home page, reopen the pages that were open last, or open the following pages. And currently we have selected the top selection, open the home page. At the top of this window we have a group of tabs, one labeled basics, one labeled personal stuff, and one labeled under the hood. The idea behind tabs is that the program needs to display more stuff than will fit in the window, so it puts all this stuff onto different tabs, and at any moment in time you're only looking at one tab. You can see here that the basics tab is currently highlighted, it's a different color, because that's the tab we are currently looking at. But if I now click on under the hood, the content displayed in this area changes. And here now we see another kind of widget, a scroll bar, which is also a widget for coping with the problem that we have more stuff to display than will fit in our window. Every scroll bar has an associated display area called a scroll pane. And right now the scroll bar is indicating that we're not seeing the entirety of this scroll pane. We're currently looking only at the top. But we can click and drag the scroll bar up and down to see the rest of the scroll pane. Finally, the last kind of widget I'll mention is what's called a menu bar. In most program windows, you'll find a menu bar directly beneath the title bar. So far, we've only talked about using the left mouse button, but what about the other mouse buttons? Well, first off, the middle mouse button, there's not much we can say about it, because it just really isn't used in most programs. The right mouse button, however, is commonly used to open what's called a context menu. The idea is that you right-click on something, and then a menu pops up with options pertaining to that thing that you right-clicked. So here, for example, if I right-click on these various icons, a menu appears with things I can click to affect that icon and you'll find that many different things can be right-clicked to get a context menu. Like say, you can right-click here on the start menu or on the taskbar here and, and so forth. A common mistake inexperienced users make is that they don't think to right-click on things. In many programs, you'll have features which are best accessed through the context menu or in some cases which can only be accessed through a context menu. So when in doubt, try right-clicking on things. Now, as for the scroll wheel on a mouse, it's really just a shortcut for moving the scroll bar up and down. So rather than mousing over and clicking on the scroll bar and dragging up and down, you can just scroll the mouse wheel up to move up, or scroll it down to move down. A double click is when the user clicks the left mouse button twice in quick succession. Very often, when you have something you can select by clicking on it once with the left mouse button, you often also can double click those things to open them or activate them. And what exactly it means to open something depends upon the context. But, for example, the most common case of double-clicking is on files. When you double-click a file, the file opens. Now, a lot of users at first have trouble double-clicking because they don't click quickly enough. What also tends to happen is that in between the first and second click, the user will move the mouse too much, and when you do that, it doesn't register as a double-click. When you double-click, you want the cursor to remain in the same place for both clicks. If it moves slightly, that's usually okay, but if it moves too much, it won't register as a double-click. The good news, though, is that double-clicking isn't all that necessary, because you can always just select something and then hit the Enter key on the keyboard, and that usually does the same thing as double-clicking something. Now we can talk about the Start menu. The Start menu I mentioned in passing is a menu which you get by clicking this button on the left of the taskbar, and it's what you use when you wish to start a program. It's also where you can go when you wish to open the control panel and some commonly used folders. And we'll talk about the control panel and folders in later units. The start menu is also where you go when you wish to shut down the computer to turn it off or when you wish to restart the computer. That's what this button in the bottom right does. It's the button for shutdown and restart. 
or I should say it's actually a pull down list. If you click that little triangle on the right, you'll see the button you click when you wish to restart instead of shut down. These words along the right side of the start menu are buttons for common folders and the control panel, which again we'll discuss in a later unit. It's this white section along the left where you see the list of programs. If you look closely here, you'll see that these top three programs are divided from the rest of the list by a faint gray line. The programs in the top section of the list are the ones I've chosen to put there. They're called the pinned programs because I've explicitly pinned them to the start menu so that they should always appear here at the top. The rest of the programs in the list here are recent programs. They are programs which I have opened recently. And as I launch other programs, this part of the list is updated automatically based upon what I've most recently opened. So the pinned programs here and the recent programs here are just a selection of all the programs I have installed on my system. If I want to see all of the programs that I have, I come down here to this button labeled All Programs. And when I click it, I get this scroll list containing everything uh, generally in alphabetical order. Now, perhaps you don't want to go into the full list to try and find a program, or maybe you're trying to find a file. Well, you have this text box down at the bottom, which you can type in to search. So, for example, if I type W and O in this search box, then it shows me a list of search results which all match on the letters W followed by O. And here at the top of the search results, you can see it lists two programs, Microsoft Word and also WordPad. So, supposing I wish to open Microsoft Word, I don't have to hunt through a list. I can just open the start menu, type W and O. I don't even have to complete the whole word. I don't have to write W-O-R-D. And then I can select Word by clicking on it. Now's a good time to take a look at the keyboard. First off, in the top left corner, you have a key labeled ESC, which is short for Escape. The Escape key isn't used all that much in today's programs, but it generally can be used as another way to dismiss dialog windows. It's like hitting Cancel. It also sometimes can be used to deselect something if you have it selected. The function keys are at the top of the keyboard and labeled F1, F2, F3, F4, and so forth up to F12. These keys aren't used very much today either in most programs, and when they are used, their meaning varies from program to program. Three more keys which are hardly used anymore are the print screen key, the scroll lock key, and the pause key. In Windows, you can hit the print screen key to capture a screenshot of the current image on the screen. When you hit the scroll lock key, you will notice that it toggles on this light on your keyboard. The light is meant to indicate whether scroll lock is currently on or off, but this is an archaic holdover. Modern operating systems like Windows and modern programs just have no concept of scroll lock, so in practice, this key just doesn't do anything. Similarly, the pause button just has no general meaning in most programs. However, in many games, you can hit the pause button and it will pause the game, but aside from that, it's just not really used anymore. At the bottom of the keyboard, you'll find two keys, both labeled CTRL, which is short for Control. Both of these keys do the same thing, there's simply two of them for the sake of convenience. The idea behind the Control key is that in many programs, you have what are called keyboard shortcuts, or key combos wherein to perform actions, rather than having to click on something, you can hold down the control key and hit some other key, like say a letter like W. And that key combination of holding control and then hitting W is the same as clicking on say some button. You'll also find at the bottom of the keyboard on both sides of the space bar, a key called Alt, which is short for alternate. The Alt key is often used in combination with the control key in key combos, but also the Alt key is used in what are called accelerators. The idea behind accelerators is that you will notice that in menu bars of programs, certain letters are underlined. And the idea is that you can hold Alt and hit that letter, and it's the same as clicking on that menu. And then in the menu that appears, you'll see that some items have certain letters underlined, and if you hit the letter on the keyboard, it's the same as clicking that item. So the Control key and the Alt key are basically about keyboard shortcuts. For things we do repeatedly and very frequently in programs, it's nice to have keyboard shortcuts because it's often easier just to hit a couple keys on the keyboard rather than having to move the mouse and click. One more key you'll see two of at the bottom of your keyboard is what's called the Windows key. 
and it's usually labeled with the Microsoft Windows icon. If you hit this key, it's the same as clicking on the Start Menu button, and the Windows Start Menu will pop up. Also, the Windows key is used in a number of shortcuts for Windows itself. For example, if you hold the Windows key and hit M, that will minimize all of your windows. The key to the right of the right side Windows key is called the Context Menu key. And as the name implies, when you hit this key, it will pop up a context menu of whatever you have selected. This is just another convenience for cases when you don't want to use a mouse. On most keyboards, you'll find these six keys grouped together, Insert, Home, Page Up, Delete, and Page Down. The Page Up and Page Down keys, as the names imply, are simply more conveniences for scrolling. When you hit Page Up, it scrolls up. When you hit Page Down, it scrolls down. When you hit the Home key, your text cursor will jump to the front of the line you are editing, and when you hit the End key, your text cursor will jump to the end of the line you are editing. The Delete key will delete the character immediately after your text cursor, or if you have something selected, it will delete what you have selected. The Insert key usually doesn't do anything. It's another archaic holdover. What it used to do in most programs is it would toggle between two text editing modes. In one mode, you would type and letters would be inserted where your text cursor is. In the other mode, uh, the letters you type would, be, would overwrite whatever is immediately after the text cursor. Eventually, program designers realized that no one actually wants to edit text that way, so there's always just the one mode now. The cursor keys, the up, down, left, and right arrows, uh, very self-evidently simply move up, down, left, and right. This group of keys on the far right side of the keyboard are collectively known as the numpad, as in number pad. And all of the keys in the numpad are actually redundant. You don't really need them because the same keys are elsewhere on the keyboard. It's just here because it's a more convenient way to enter a bunch of numbers. The trick with the numpad, however, is that some of these keys have two labels. For example, the 7 key is also labeled as home. These keys with two labels are why there's the key in the top left called numlock. When you hit the numlock key, you'll notice another light on your keyboard toggles on and off. When the light is on, numlock is on, and you can use these keys to enter numbers. When the light is off, numlock is off, and hitting these keys won't insert numbers. Instead, when you hit 7, it's the same as hitting the home key. So if you ever find yourself trying to use the numpad, but it's not entering numbers, just make sure numlock is on. Frankly, this is a very annoying feature. I think most users would much prefer it if numlock were always just on by default. If you've ever used a typewriter, you should be familiar with the shift keys. When you hold a shift key down and then hit a letter like J, it'll insert an uppercase J rather than a lowercase J. Also, you have a number of keys on the keyboard, like say the number keys, where there is a secondary character written above, like say the one key has an exclamation mark above it. That indicates that when you hold shift down and hit the one key, it will insert an exclamation mark rather than a number one. The caps lock key, which is above the left shift key, is another key which toggles between two modes. When you hit the caps lock key, you will notice this other light on the keyboard toggle on and off. When caps lock is on, hitting a letter key will insert an uppercase character, and holding shift and then hitting that same key will insert a lowercase character, so it effectively reverses the normal behavior with shift. However, this reversal only affects the letter keys, so if you want to insert an exclamation mark, you still have to hold down shift when you hit the one key. Above the caps lock key is the tab key. In some text editing programs, when you hit the tab key, it inserts what's called a tab character, which is basically the equivalent of about four or five spaces. In many other programs, however, hitting the tab key will cycle keyboard focus, meaning that it will move the keyboard focus to some other element in the program. So, for example, here in this program where I compose an email, I have three text fields I need to fill in. To type in a text field, normally I need to click on it to give it keyboard focus. But here's what I can do with a tab key. I can click in the text field at the top, the one where I'm supposed to put an email address, the recipient of this email, and then move to the text field where I need to fill in the subject, I hit the tab key. 
once I'm done typing out the subject for this email, I can just hit tab again and it takes me down to where I write the actual body message of the email. So here using the tab key, I very conveniently was able to type in these different text fields without taking my hands off the keyboard to move the mouse. Finally, the last key on the keyboard is the enter key. And notice that there's two of them, one on the numpad, but they're really just the same key. In most contexts, when you're typing text and you hit enter, it's effectively like a carriage return on a typewriter. It takes you down to the next line. In all other contexts, the enter key is used to effectively activate whatever you have highlighted. Like say, if you have a list of menu items and you can use the cursor keys to move up and down the list, uh, to actually select something in the list, you hit enter. It's like clicking on the thing which is currently selected. We need to say a little bit more about the taskbar because the taskbar I showed you earlier was the version that you saw in Windows Vista and earlier. In Windows 7, Microsoft changed the taskbar a little bit. What you should see in Windows 7 looks more like this. The main change here is that some of these buttons on the taskbar represent programs which aren't currently open. If you take a closer look at these buttons, you'll notice that some, like the one in the middle here, are highlighted. This highlighting indicates that it represents an actually open program. The button to its right, in contrast, isn't highlighted, indicating that that program is not currently open, but we're seeing it here because this program has been pinned to the taskbar, so its button is always visible and we can click on it to actually run the program. This program button on the left, you'll notice, has highlighting, but it looks a bit different. This highlighting indicates that there are actually multiple windows for this program, and if you were to click on this button, you would see little thumbnails of all of its windows, and you then can click on one of these thumbnails to select that window. Now, if you're wondering how to pin or unpin programs from the taskbar, you can do so simply by right-clicking on a program's button in the taskbar or in the Start menu, and you'll see in the Context menu an option to pin or unpin that program. Also note that you can reorder these buttons in the taskbar simply by clicking and dragging them. You may have noticed that the taskbar includes a section of smaller icons off to the right next to where the time is displayed. This area of the taskbar is called the system tray or sometimes called the notification area. The idea behind the system tray is that there are some programs we wish to keep running, but we don't need to interact with them on a frequent basis. So for such programs, it's not appropriate that they have an always visible window and that they have a button on the taskbar. Instead, they just get reduced to a little icon off in the system tray. So for example, there's a little speaker icon in the system tray for volume control. If you click that, you get a little slider, which you can slide up and down to adjust the volume on your system. Windows has this concept of what it calls the clipboard. The idea of the clipboard is that it is a program independent place where we can put data and then we can take the data on the clipboard and then copy the data back to other programs. Most commonly this data is just text but it can be image data or it can be as we'll see in the next unit it could be either files or folders among other things. The way we use the clipboard is with three operations called copy, paste, and cut. A copy operation, as the name implies, copies data to the clipboard. A paste operation copies the data from the clipboard into a program. And then the cut operation is a variant on copy. It's the same thing, except after copying, it will delete the original data. So cut is what you use when you wish to move something rather than copy it. So for example, say I'm editing text in Microsoft Word, and also at the same time I'm editing text in Notepad. If I wish to copy this text from Word to Notepad, I first highlight the text I wish to copy, then right-click on the highlighted text, and then in the context menu I select Copy. That copies this highlighted text to the clipboard. I then go into Notepad and I place the keyboard cursor where I wish to insert the text. I then right-click there and select Paste in the context menu. That copies the text from the clipboard to right here where I have the keyboard cursor. Now, very importantly, we only copied the data from the clipboard. The data is still there in the clipboard. So if I move the keyboard cursor and paste again, it inserts the text once more. So in fact, as long as something remains on the clipboard, you can paste it as many times as you like. Also, very importantly, 
we can paste data from the same program which we originally copied that data. So I can go to Word here and paste this text as many times as I like. So here now the text is repeated three times. The cut operation, again, is the same thing as copying, except then it's like you deleted the text after you copied it. So here, if I highlight it was the best of times, and then select cut, the text disappears. But then if I paste, it reappears where I have my keyboard cursor, and I can paste it as many times as I like. And finally, be clear that the clipboard only holds one thing, so every time you copy or cut, you are effectively overwriting whatever was previously in the clipboard. So here if I copy, it was the worst of times, but then copy, it was the best of times, well, that was the last thing I copied, so when I paste, it pastes, it was the best of times, because that's the text which is on the clipboard when I paste it.